Um, my name is Michael Waltemata. I, uh, those of you who have seen me speak uh, in, the, um, in the plenary on the panel this morning, I'm from the Euro Ruhr University in Bochum in Germany, and I'm in the theology, the Protestant theology department, and I teach practical theology and religious education. And what I'm going to show you is a project from one of the courses I teach, um, basically trying to integrate some science and technology education into the humanities or the religion curriculum. Um, I'm here, I'm presenting this on behalf of my students, that is Carmen Jäger, Stefanie Lindheim, Antti Lück, Norman Uhlenbrock, Frauke Warmann, and then myself, who were uh, on this project, and we actually took this project to uh, the European Space Agency's Technology Center and presented it there. And it got some really, really good uh, commentaries and was very well received. And I'm happy to be able to present that here. So um, just to, to give you some more information about the background, we um, thought about how can you, what, what possible contribution can theology have to future human space exploration. And the students came up with this idea of sanctifying the hidden eco-cycle. Um, and the idea goes as follows. If you look at human space exploration on a, on a time scale, we are today sending professionals out into space. We've sent a couple of space tourists. So there is this perspective that Today, there's professional astronauts. They know what they're, what they're letting themselves into. They know what the risks are, or at least they seem to know what the risks are. And then in the future, there will be space tourists, people who pay for the pleasure of going to outer space. And maybe in the far future, people will move to outer space, emigrate to outer space, become citizens of other planets, other societies in outer space. Um, excuse me, I just got to some water. Um, so that means um, when theologians look at something like this, they boil it down to the basics. So let's talk about the interesting things about space exploration. Let's talk about death in space. Um, if an astronaut today dies, that is a tragic incident, and it is framed within popular culture or within the understanding of a society as the death of a hero. A space hero, you can, you can compare that to, to other heroic activities where people die inadvertently. Um, and there are established ceremonies um, that deal with that and that have embedded religious content. And I'm trying to give you an example. This is the... Unfortunately, my computer is too crappy to properly scroll to the, to the correct part. I'll, I'll come around and play with that from this end. What happened there? When did he appear? He just, he just came right out. That's good. That's good. He was supposed to come on right now. As if he knew that he was going to come on. Yeah, he already thought about it. <laughs> there he is. All right. That's you probably all remember that. That was the Challenger disaster. And Ronald Reagan gave that speech from the Oval Office that children of America who were watching the live coverage of the shuttle's takeoff. I know it's hard to understand, but some, and I want to say something to the school children. Of Let's start here, right? That was the first teacher in space, the program teachers in space, and it was horribly wrong, right? So now he's talking to the school children, and then he's giving it a frame, a national, and also a religious frame. America who were watching the live coverage of the shuttle's takeoff. I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of the process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. I've always had great faith in and respect for our space program. And what happened today does nothing to diminish it. We don't hide our space program. We don't keep secrets and cover things up. We do it all up front and in public. That's the way freedom is, and we wouldn't change it for a minute. We'll continue our quest in space. There will be more shuttle flights and more shuttle crews, and yes, more volunteers, more civilians, 
more teachers in space. Nothing ends here. Our hopes and our journeys continue. I want to add that I wish I could talk to every man and woman who works for NASA or who worked on this mission and tell them your dedication and professionalism have moved and impressed us for decades, and we know of your anguish. We share it. There's a coincidence today. On this day, 390 years ago, the great explorer Sir Francis Drake died aboard ship off the coast of Panama. In his lifetime, the great frontiers were the oceans, and a historian later said he lived by the sea, died on it, and was buried in it. Well, today, we can say of the Challenger crew, their dedication was, like Drake's, complete. The crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us for the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. Thank you. Let's suppose that you're writing a really Um, when an astronaut dies, there's established protocol to deal with it. There is um, a way of integrating that into religious tradition. There's a way of integrating that into a national mythology. And you have ways to explain it and to make meaning out of that. Now, what happens if we go one further? If it's no longer the professional, the person you can identify with a nation or a specific religion or a specific belief, si belief system or political system, but what if it is a private citizen, the space tourist, as you see in that nice picture there? So what happens to coping with death in the next 50 years in space exploration? It's comparable to random death on vacation. You go to some place, and you die there. So thinking about the future, that would probably mean that the first, say, an N smaller than five tourist death in outer space would be also considered as a national tragedy, as the Challenger astronauts, the Columbia astronauts, and others who perished during space exploration were. But if the number gets larger, then you would revert to established Earth-centered ceremonies with an individualized content. And um, my students suggested that it could be similar to burial ceremony protocol for soldiers who died in battle in other countries, right? You would still need a protocol to deal with that. You would need to try and bring the body home, which from Earth orbit is more or less possible. Um, so we have an established Earth protocol how to deal with death and body. And we can transform that to outer space. Space tourists can be brought home. And for further ex expansion of tourism, um, as it is related to death on vacation, maybe you could also go and have private burial ceremonies in outer space. Because you can, when you go on vacation and die there, choose to stay there or leave the body there. And there is, interestingly enough, a design on that. It's a design study on the so-called body back with CK at the end. And this is what it looks like. It's basically a sleeping bag. It's a bit hard to explain why they put the American flag on it, but um, obviously it's an American design. And you can put the body in the bag zip up the bag, and the bag is not made of plastic. It's, it's, it's a permeable fabric. And then you put it into the shadow of your spacecraft so that the body will, on the one hand, freeze. And as the air pressure outside of the body is very close to zero, all the available li liquids, even if they are frozen, will evaporate over time. So what you're left with is bones, and frozen tissue. And here comes the gruesome slash interesting part. You've just lost most of the weight of that body. Now you attach it 
in case of the ISS, to the robot arm and shake it. Shake it long enough so that the bones splinter, the tissue collapses, and you're left with basically what is left over after you've burned a body here on Earth, only that the oxygen content is still there, right? Because you, didn't have burn, you haven't burned it. So you're left with a fine powder that has lost all the weight of the water. So a body would approximately weigh, I don't know, how much is it? Five pounds? If, yeah, yeah the, the, the glass that you get a bo burnt body in. Yeah, it's, about a, it's less than that. It's about a pound, one and a half pounds. And then you could take that back to Earth if you are a space tourist. So that solves the problem of storing a body in outer space because you don't want that on your spacecraft, right? Decomposition processes make that quite unpleasant. So freeze drying and destroying the bones would make it safe to transport. So you could, on the one hand, have a space funeral with that leftovers, or, and this is where it begins to get really interesting and theologically relevant, you could look at the eco-cycle of your spacecraft and try to integrate the dead person into the hidden eco-cycle of a future space colony. So if we were to go way out, and this is just one example of a space colony, could also be a settlement on the surface of Mars or on the surface of the moon, um, you will have further problems. While on Earth we have enough biomass to compensate in the eco-cycle, should we decide to just get rid of our bodies off Earth. In a space settlement, we would not have that. If we were, if we were thinking about small self-contained communities, you can't afford to lose any resources. Just the idea of freeze-drying a body would lose you all the water that was in there, and there, with, with that, all the potential hydrogen and oxygen that you could use. So in self-sustainable space colonies, on the one hand, you cannot get rid of a body, on the other hand, that what we have on Earth, the hidden eco-cycle, and when you listen to, to, to funeral sermons, that eco-cycle is often integrated into that and made sort of overt, right? He has returned to the Earth where he came from. Um, if you listen to non-religious uh, ceremonies, he will now be eaten by creatures and then his, his biology will be reintegrated with the biology around him, like trees will grow from that dead person. That would be totally overt in small space colonies. So over the course of life, the hidden eco-cycle would be just visible to anybody. And how do you deal with this? And that's where theology comes in, gives an interesting perspective on that. Um, you could in a space colony and take that depiction you're just seeing on the screen. Um, what's the word? Yeah, that's that's the process I'm looking at. But so 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 you could you could um, sorry for that. You could declare this area necessary for making sure that there's enough enough oxygen, right? This could be the plants that are responsible for your recycling of the air, and those could be the plants that you want to eat. So you could de devote that was the word I was looking for. You could devote certain parts of your of your, um, of your ground space to certain tasks within the, uh, within the uh, space colony. And then, over generations, you might, as you keep integrating humans into that, uh, into that ecosystem by, as you said, composting, you could decide that a dead person is 100% resource and you could devote 90% of that dead person for nutrition and part of the eco-cycle for food production, and the other 10% could go into the left-hand area for atmospheric cleansing, where, where you want plants to grow to produce oxygen and biomass for the colony. And by integrating part of that dead person in a ceremonial setting, right, you would need to de de um, design rituals for that, you would sanctify that part of the eco-cycle. And you would solve a couple of problems there. On the one hand, you would solve the problem that a human just becomes a resource without any further meaning to the human person. Um, on the other hand, 
you would sanctify the ground and thereby for generations, even if it is no longer possible to communicate the necessity for biomass production or for oxygen cleansing, you would communicate that you'd rather not step on the air cleaner without having to say it again and again and again. So this is what my students found was the, um, was the contribution that theology could do to future space exploration. I find it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting concept. Um, I think the idea of making this hidden eco-cycle overt through religious ritual um, integrates both science, technology, and religion. And the theological perspective they put down to this then shall the dust return to the earth, earth as it was, right? So this, this, this what we use in funerals anyway. Um, and they say that by revealing this hidden eco-cycle, the humans are confronted with an issue that was never raised before, which is not quite correct. It was raised before, but it was never raised in that the design of a ritual made possible the devotion of certain areas of the landscape to necessary societal or biological task. And obviously, theology is the right way to address this issue. So we would experience a societal reliance on death and dying. The living part of society would recognize the, their reliance on dead people and on death and dying. And that would give us a totally different understanding of the, the circle of human life within one ecosystem. So you could say that the holy ground is a biological sanctuary because of the buried people in there, but also because of the sustain, the, the, its sustaining effect on the living population. And with that, I close the presentation and thank you for your attention. So we got, we got 10 minutes for discussion, right? We can, oh, okay. we can discuss longer. The next speaker is um, fine with us discussing longer, oh, okay. that's all for me. Oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I do agree. If we we could we could easily go ninety eight and two percent. And and when you look at when you look at um, space burial possibilities now, that's exactly what they do. They just take a very very small amount of of the person and they shoot it into into orbit or on a suborbital flight. You can also have that. That was also part of this course um, or of this discussion. You can also have parts of your your own body or a relative's body pressed into a diamond, right? Take the carbon, make a diamond out of it. That would, that would solve several problems that you just mentioned. I mean, it would use energy, but maybe that's free where you are in the solar system. Um, and it would save space, make it look different, right? Give it, give it a different appearance. Uh, and thus, um, on that level, point out that there is something has happened to that human, yeah. Yeah, I think where the idea came from for this is a, 
Well, it's a, it's a rather new movement in German churches to, to integrate burial grounds into churches, right? They, the, so they have sort of shelves on the side where you can where you can have the remains, the burnt remains of a human or of a, of a member of the congregation. So the dead and the living celebrate services together. And I think this is what, what also was behind that, uh, that idea. Please. Oh. I mean, that, that would totally rhyme with, with this idea that that is in here that in, in an ecosystem, the scale of one planet, that doesn't matter. If you lead line the casket, um, that has no consequences. May, well, maybe if the groundwater is, is uh, polluted by lead, but for the eco-cycle, it has, usually has little consequence. In a self-sustainable space colony, that would be a very bad idea to not reintegrate those people. And that's why you need to figure out a way how to do that. You were... So the, um, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, what, what is the, so I've, I've just given you numbers, right? Random numbers, 90% for nutrition and 10% for remembrance. We could have gone with any other number. I didn't talk about the state of the material that was boing, being reintegrated, right? You said compost. You could, you, could, you could imagine a big blender. You could imagine burning it and then just using the, um, um, the chemicals that, that would fertilize, for instance, right? Uh, bone meal you already use. Um, so there's different ways of doing that. I think cannibalism is probably way out there, but in a way, this is mediated cannibalism. But, but then, right, even, even a vegetarian is probably a mediated cannibalist in that, in that regard. So, yeah, I, don't, I, I think that would be, that in the beginning, that would probably, no, let me rephrase that that would never be a problem because on our way from small-scale space exploration to larger settlements in space, the first people who would go there would be the professionals who would be easily able to deal with that. And once you have a, um, a more diverse general population, that would already be established protocol. So I think it would not be a problem, but it would still help to have a ritual like that to deal with that. So there's two more questions. I don't know who was first. You were first. Well, what do you think of the idea of spending most of the resources on the rem remembrance by having a biography written of a person two hours deep in German soil? And, 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 and leaving the 10% or using just, just leaving that out? Or, or is it not in relation to, to what I just Yeah, so it's, I think that's, a, that's a, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking different things there. On the one hand, that's a fairly, fairly good idea. It, it, it gives meaning to the life that was lived. On the other hand, if we speak about small-scale space colonies, there's a resource problem. Who's going to write it? Do we store it on computers and stuff? That can easily be sorted out. But yeah, digitally. Yeah, digitally, for instance. Um, interestingly enough, I would expect that at least at the beginning of a space colony, such a record would already be there. 
then you would have a rather technical record of the person's life. You would just need to um, need to um, to upgrade that with meaning construction, right? So that could easily be done. Yeah. Oh, so. I think you you were you not. Uh, So, so um, I was surprised when the students who had sort of a hard time coming, really getting this idea to fruition, um, came up with this extremely pragmatic version of it. So yeah, I agree with that. It is pragmatic, and when you look at what, what has been written about dealing with bodies, for instance, uh, from, from an Islamic perspective on the International Space Station, even that would work, no problem. So, so most religions could probably just work their way in there. Okay, last question. Yeah, yeah, you're right. We're talking. We're talking. We're talking. We're talking end of life and and per, permanent records, yeah. right? Yeah, and yeah. digital doesn't have that feeling to it. Yeah. Right, right. Mm. Maybe we should maybe we should borrow from Elon Musk that that digital storage <laughs> thing that he put in the back of the Tesla. That seems to be rather rather long living. So. Yeah. Okay, as new people have come in, I think we just switch to the next yeah. next talk. The trouble yeah. with digital records is 500 years from now, we have to have a device that can read them. We already have that problem. Yeah, with the, a problem. So maybe your solution or diamonds would be a good. Yeah. yeah, diamonds could be that's, that's a friend. I'm just saying. Okay, um, how do I do this? Um, <laughs> can you see something? I don't want you to see all my files. <laughs> coming up, coming up, coming up. Hello, um, welcome for the people that just came in. And um, Michael just um, spoke and he's gonna speak again. And his topic is for all humankind, selection and global agency in space exploration initiatives. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I can't, can't stop talking, right? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some ideas on on a um, on a project that I was working with with a sociology friend of mine a sociologist friend of mine and we've been thinking about what does space exploration mean in the context of a global society especially in the light of this changing involvement from government agencies to private contractors so. Um, for this presentation, I, I took a look at um, at some of the 
the facts I could find about how space agencies constructed their, their astronaut corps, the people who went to space, the people who worked for them. So just to give you an idea, this is a, this is a hard copy from a, um, a Wikipedia article on, on the nationalities of astronauts. So when you look at space exploration from a selection criteria, how do you get into space, right? How do you raise the probability to go into space? Well, it's um, fairly easy nation from a point of nationality. You should be an American. That works really well because that makes it easier to go into space. Then a Russian would be good. And then some other countries like Japan, Germany, and China. Japan and China have their own space agencies. Um, China even with launching capability, Japan not so much. Germany does not have that. All the German astronauts have either flown with Russian spacecraft during the Soviet times or with American spacecraft or with Russian spacecraft and American astronauts as you no longer have launch capabilities. Sorry. Um, then there were French astronauts, Canadian and Italian astronauts, and then 33 astronauts from other countries, including Afghanistan and uh, smaller nations, um, but Pakistan, India too, Israel for instance. So the big players are Russia and the United States. If you want to go into space, you should have ties to them. That would make it fairly easy. Now, that's just one thing, nationality. The other thing as a selection criteria you could look at are biological factors. For instance, gender. If you want to be an astronaut, it's still easier to be male, as it was when the first seven Mercury astronauts were selected. I mean, look at that picture. That's pretty cool, right? Um, I would fit right in there, slightly tanned, male. I'm 15 years too old for that, but still. If you look at the rest of the space agency at that time, same thing. White men around 35 years old, a bit younger than I am now, and um, the same group. That has changed. From the 550 astronauts that went to space, 61 were female. So about 12% female. By the way, same thing for the Chinese who have launching capabilities only for a couple of years. No, better than that. They've launched 13 astronauts and two of them were female. So much better rate, right? The 18% of them female. This is the newest astronaut group, NASA's newest astronaut group. There is one, two, three, four, five females in there. Six. One, two. Oh, hang on. One, two, three. Four, five, five females in there out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Five out of twelve. Nearly fifty percent. So it's getting better and better in an equality sense when it comes to gender. And this is the ISS um, mission control center, and when you look at that, it looks nothing like this anymore. So there's diversity in gender, but also in ethnicity, ethnicity, and of course, as it's the International Space Station, in nationality. So biological factors as selection criteria are not, are not what they were once. But when you look at the astronaut corps, it's still not representing the world population as it could or maybe should. Now, the other factors to consider are social factors. If you want to become an astronaut, um, there's certain criteria you have to have. And those are basically the same for most of the countries with space programs. For NASA, you have to have at least a bachelor's degree in engineering or science or math. And then you need to have three years of professional experience, 1,000 pilot hours in command of a jet aircraft, or if you don't have three years of professional experience, and I, I omitted something in there, you can substitute an advanced degree, like a master's degree or a doctoral degree for that experience. So what you need is education. And that means you need access to education. 
Nobody's going to become an astronaut if he or she is not really well educated as a social factor. So that is also a selection criteria for astronauts at this point in time. And then, and I could have put that under biological factors, but I chose to put it under social factors, then you have to have the ability to pass an astronaut physical, which is on the one hand biological, you have to be able to run that fast, hold your breath that long, and so on and so forth. Your body has to be okay. But look at the, look at the, the, the smaller points. The visual acuity must be correctable to 2020 for each eye. So you also need to have access to that possibility of correcting your eyesight which should be easy enough as a, in a country in the US where probably NASA will pick up the bill. But what if that is not the case? What if you have to invest your own money? So then suddenly health also becomes a social factor. This has been what I've just talked to you about. This has been the case for the last 70 years, basically. And now something else is happening. We start having private space flight. Private enterprises enter the space arena. So now you can substitute your bachelor's degree, your eyesight, with money. And I'll give you some examples. In 2017, Elon Musk announced that the SpaceX Dragon capsule that would be on a test flight around the moon would carry two space tourists who had put down, quote, a significant deposit to take a trip around the moon. And the Verge, where I got that comment from, then speculated how much that would have cost, right? And they, they said that a, a cost of one seat on a Roscosmos Soyuz costs $81 million. Unless you are NASA and buy them in bulk, if you buy 10 seats at once, the price goes down to $74 million. So if you've got $740 million lying around and you want 10 family members to fly, yeah, that's, that's probably, that's a smart idea. Ask the church if they have that much money lying around. He'll, he'll, he'll pay for it. Oh, birthday party. Yeah, also maybe, maybe some religious organization. Um, sorry. The company Space Adventures that has been selling seats on Soyuz spacecraft to space tourists estimates the cost of a trip around the moon at $175 million at this time, if you wanted to go there. On the other hand, Elon Musk has said one year before the significant deposit was put down that a price for a trip to Mars on one of his big Falcon rockets um, would be equivalent to buying a house in the US. And the median price of a house in the United States of America seems to be 200,000 US dollars. At least it was in 2016. So this is, there's a large difference in price. But what you can see is people have done that. They have paid for their trips. People will be paying for their trips. And this will completely change the way we need to think about space travel. And that's when, um, when uh, my, my colleague and I came up with the idea of looking at it from a perspective of beyond selection. Let's forget about selection processes and how to make this, um, make this more equal, but let's think about what happens with this notion that is in sociology known as agency. The capacity of individuals to act independently and make their own free choices, as in opposition to being limited by social structures. Right? Factors that limit an agent, not having enough money, or your social class, your religion, your gender, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. While we do acknowledge that social class or availability of financial resources is still something that needs to be considered, in the long run, the question is, how will this notion of agency change space travel for future generations? So to take a closer look at agency, agency means the independent capability or ability to act on one's own free will and the necessary cognitive belief structure based on your own experience. So what do astronauts know? What do they bring with them to space? And what does that do to the things that they do in space? Then, it's be, then it relies on the societal perception of one's environment, which is different in space than it is on Earth. It's also reliant on the social environment you're in. 
and that is something that I've already talked about a little in the, in the former talk, um, and it relies on social agreements on potential agency, um, and there's a huge potential for conflict. If you do not do what your children, what your parents want you to do as a child, there's a conflict between agency, your own agency and the agency that your parents see fit for, for you, and that could also pose problems or did pose problems in space exploration. And I will give you, yeah, spend the next 10 minutes to give you some more examples, and then we are probably at the end of my time, you can ask some more questions. So some examples. Examples from religion. When Apollo 8 flew around the moon, 1968, on Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, sorry, the astronauts read from the biblical story of creation. Agency, their worldview, what they wanted to say at that point in time, and also influenced by what they saw out of their window, which is Earth rise, the earth rising above the horizon of the moon. So they quoted from biblical scripture, and at the end of that quote, Bill Anderson blessed the population of earth. It was Christmas Eve, and for them, that was the appropriate thing to do from the orbit of the moon. The next day, um, the president of the American Atheist Association sued the US government for spending tax dollars, uh, taxpayers' money on sending religious messages to Earth. The case went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and um, I, I just love that example, because the Supreme Court threw it out, ruling that as the US Supreme Court, it did not have jurisdiction in lunar orbit. <laughs> now, now, here's the thing that, 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 is, that is interesting in, in another capacity that also has to do with agency and structure. The Obama administration, made a law on space mining, asteroid mining. So if you would play that law that is within the scope of the Outer Space Treaty from 1967 against this Supreme Court decision, that would, that, that would be really interesting. I'm no lawyer, I can't, I can't really say what, what, what would come out of it, but the idea that on the one hand, the US Supreme Court has no jurisdiction in outer space, on the other hand, the government of the United States can say something about resource allocation in outer space, that's an interesting conundrum. That's where religion shines. Um, now another example, same decade, one year later, when Apollo 11 was supposed to launch to land the first men on moon, these guys, and the, 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 the guy in the front is the Reverend Abernathy, uh, somebody who was with uh, Martin Luther King during, during his lifetime, um, he took 12 African Americans, in his own words, poor African Americans, to Kennedy Space Center to protest, and in his own words, not the launch of Apollo 11, but the unjust perception of, 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 of money, exp and is it expenditure? Yeah, by the government. And they went there and protested this launch. Now here's the, the story about that. That was religious opposition to space exploration. And uh, I already said that on the panel this morning, Thomas Paine, the NASA administrator, invited them in discussed with them, invited them to watch the launch. As they had said, they were not going to there, there to protest the launch, but rather to point out that the money could be better spent in other ways. So again, agency and structure, right? That was from their perspective, from their social standing, within the stru social structure they were in, their way of dealing with that. After the launch, however, Abernathy professed that Kennedy Space Center was indeed holy ground, and what he had witnessed was a truly religious experience. So there's this dichotomy between religious agency as, um, as needing to, to care for the poor, and on the other hand, seeing something tremendously happen for a society that advances it, which, which is a really, really interesting example. I'll give you some more. Um, still religion in outer space. Now religion has transformed. This is a cr celebration of Christmas. You will obviously notice that um, the Christian symbol here seems to be on the one hand the tree, the hat perhaps, I don't know. And there's a crucifix up there. So again, 
structure and agency on the International Space Station. As there is a lot of Russian cosmonauts up there, they brought their religious symbols, their religious icons to the International Space Station. Christianity is still very much present in our presence in outer space. On the ground, Orthodox priests bless launchers. This has been criticized as being not a religious but a nationalistic right. Um, you could probably argue both ways. Here too, agency of a nation state as a nationalistic gesture or agency of a religious entity as the Orthodox Church comes into play. Other religions have shown their compatibility with space exploration. Um, Israeli astronaut Ilan Ramon, not the first Jewish astronaut, not the last Jewish astronaut, but the first one to have an institute for space halacha founded. So two rabbis, he asked rabbis how to kind of live Judaism in outer space and they, they um, made rules for him and founded an institute and uh, had rabbinic decisions on how to be a Jew on the International Space Station. Same thing for this guy. Oh, I think this oh yeah. I don't know if you can, if, 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 if that video is moving. Um, this is Sheikh Mustafa Mazur, a Malayan astronaut, um, one of the first openly Muslim astronauts. The other Muslim astronauts who flew on Soviet spacecraft were not allowed to show their religion that much. Um, and he had a religious ruling written for him, how to pray, when to pray, how to do. There were actually rules in there how to deal with dead bodies in outer space and, and such. Another example from religion, religious uh, opposition, and just a very short one, we all know that Mars 1 is, is uh, yeah, well. But the interesting fact is, when they suggested one-way missions to Mars, a Muslim religious authority, in opposition to this example, stepped up and said, hey, one-way missions to Mars, comparable to suicide, and suicide is a sin in Islam, Islam is the religion that cares for all life on earth, so you shouldn't do that if you're a Muslim. Right? So, so very, very interesting to see how agency of Muslim one-way astronauts is restricted by structural decisions of a religious authority. As a, as a Christian theologian, I can say that because there's also Christian groups that use basically the same arguments. Um, okay. I'm going way over time if I finish this, but anyways. Um, interpretation as a mode of dealing with space exploration. I've already shown you that picture. The overview effect is what the astronauts perceived who saw that. Suddenly, they saw themselves outside of Earth and could see Earth as a whole, like that, and perceived that only this tiny blue sheen is our atmosphere, the stuff that keeps us alive here. And that changed their perspective. And they still do that. Once this module, Cupula, had been added to the International Space Station, the number of time the astronauts spent, the, the, the amount of time the astronauts spent looking at Earth rose dramatically. And you can, you, can, you can prove that. I, I did that with students. Um, we took a look at the protocols, what astronauts do on the International Space Station. So you can see that in the protocols, but you can also see that. This is an interesting gender aspect, by the way. Look at the woman in cupula and look at the guys in cupula. That's, right? That's, that, that's, it's a bit weird. Um, the amount of pictures taken of Earth rose dramatically. The, the data stream from the International Space Station, the downstream, had much more images of the surface of the planet Earth in it. And this all is a consequence of the framing of seeing the Earth from the outside as a nearly religious experience. I'll give you one example from um, Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut, and uh, I would um, I would draw you, want to draw your attention to the second paragraph. You want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck, drag him a quarter of a million miles out, and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. Because looking at the Earth from the outside makes everything political on Earth seem petty, right? Different experience. That, that, is not only, that, that is not only true for lunar orbit. When you're on Skylab, you experience the same thing. You see how diminutive your life and concerns are compared to other things in the universe. 
And even if you're not a professional astronaut, but an astronaut, a space tourist, like Anushe Ansari is, um, you perceive that. It's an experience that exceeds all expectations, something hard to put to words, and here she maybe goes a bit overboard. All these things that make him big and impossible, we can do this, he's from Earth, no problem. That's, that's a bit, it seems a bit unrealistic, but it's obviously something that the, she needed to say after she had experienced that. So space, the experience of outer space, also true for Russian cosmonauts, by the way, not only for American astronauts, um, changed their view of agency on Earth. The space environment gives you new possibilities for working on Earth. I'll just skip the next two parts and go to something else. What about, and this is where, where I think it gets really interesting, what about if we think about agency for others? Space exploration, and this is something different from what I've been talking before, space agency as agency for others. We have those rules for planetary protection, and those have been hotly debated here at the Mars Society, because they basically mean that there is a binding legal set of rules, and it comes down to whenever you want to go to a planetary body in the solar system, you have to limit to lower than one in 10,000 the chance of bringing one single viable Earth organism into a potential habitat, which makes human exploration of Mars impossible, right? As soon as the first human steps on the surface of Mars, that would be, that rule would be broken. So the question you can ask yourself is, where does that come from, right? What is the structure behind that, and why does this structure hinder human agency on the surface of Mars? Um, I've written a paper with two friends from JPL, and we are, we were, we are basically discussing what you could, why the rule is the way it is, and how you would need to deal with that rule. And our, our argument is, why one in 10,000? Look at the numbers, why? is the chance of contaminating another planet. Why does that need to be lower than a lifetime death, uh, higher than a lifetime death from aircraft accident, and lower than, for instance, winning the lottery? Why not a completely different number? And our argument would be, this is a can-do number from the 1930s, it comes from making sure that fruit tins were not contaminated with botulism. So this is comparing the death of a single human being with the contamination of a whole ecosystem. And we should have a discussion about that. We should have a discussion about what this number needs to be. I have personally nothing invested in that. If somebody comes up with a good argument for making it even harder to go to Mars, I would be sad. But if it's a good argument, I could live with it. But the question is, why do we not have a discussion like that? Why do we not, why do we keep the structure that we have that hinders the agency of future astronauts? And why do we not question the structure to maybe enable more agency in astronauts? And the last thing, and this is a bit more controversial probably, is what if we really think about agency for others. And by vicarious agency, I do not mean the psychological problem, but the idea of having agency for other biological beings. What if we think about sending life to other planets, establishing a Mars colony, or going even farther out into space as preserving the idea of life or the structure of life itself, right? Sending life to the universe so that it does not, as it will here in 1.2 billion years, eventually die out in this solar system. We do not know if there's other life out there, so why not make, have agency for other life and send it out into the universe? And I'm working at, with a group at the University of California at Santa Barbara on sending small creatures to exoplanets around other stars. You've probably heard of the Breakthrough Starshot project. This is not Breakthrough Starshot, this is a project that is affiliated with them. It's called Starlight, and it's a NASA NIAC project, and they are trying to send on a chip 
ship, a computer waiver with about 10 centimeter, that's three and a half inches, 3.75 inches diameter. Um, they want to send those tardigrades. The water, water bear? Yeah, that's what you call them. And the research, research on them has shown they can survive freezing, boiling, extreme pressure, ionizing radiation, dehydration, and even the vacuum of deep space. Not for a very long time, but for maybe long enough to get them there. And um, while on the one hand, you should pray that they have showed memories, on the other hand, you would thereby enable life to exist in other solar systems, or you would want to send, you could send life out into the universe. And that would give you give us as humans agency over other creatures with the problems that come with it. Can we have that? Can we have agency for others? But it also questions this problem of planetary protection that I just pointed out to you, because when your argument for planetary protection is um, making sure that science can still be done, this argument does no longer work for exoplanets because you will not destroy science. And then you really need to have an ethical discussion about why you would want planetary protection for other exoplanets. And the last thing I want to point out is when you take agency for others, you just have to think about what that would do to their agency, because what if this happens and they come back <laughs> and destroy us all. So, so in closing, I want to show you that we have selection criteria for space missions, and those selection criteria will change. They are already changing. And they affect, as does the space environment and the social factors around it, the, the knowledge and the agency processes that astronauts have for space exploration. And uh, we should very carefully think what we want those to be and how we want to deal with that in the future. And I think I've, I've outlived my time, so sorry about that, and thank you for listening.